time I turn and strut around right at the door to life, and I count the days.
Welcome to the investiture ceremony for the class of 2013. I want to offer a warm welcome to our graduates, friends, and family who have supported them for the past two years. And of course, all of you who have cheered them on from afar and who have traveled here to celebrate their accomplishments. Welcome to our faculty and staff who are at the center of our educational efforts and to Dartmouth trustee and a Tuck alumnus, Stephen Roth. Our legacy goes back far into the 19th century when Dartmouth grad Edward Tuck and Dartmouth president William Jewett Tucker agreed to create the world's first master's degree in management. Our direction was set by Edward Tuck's language that you will hear more of at the end of our ceremony, where he emphasized the larger meaning of business. From that time to now, there is a long line of special business leaders who started from this very place, just like you, all of whom were transformed by the experience here. And that legacy will continue far over the horizon. Tuck does aim to transform each individual at a very important time in life. That time after one has finished the long round of basic education, when one has tasted some of the lessons of experience, both personal and organizational, at a time when one must set career goals. This is the time when aspirations are at their highest and when wanting to get on with making a difference in the world is at its peak. Some might say that it's an odd time to try to transform adults. Aren't they already fully formed? They are, after all, way beyond college. They already know a thing or two. This is all true. And yet, the members of Tuck class after class have felt a profound transformation. When they walk down the aisle for their hoods, they simply are not the same people who started two years before. They, you, arrived here from all over the globe with virtually no connections before and with vastly different experiences, family histories, and cultures. And yet, they, now you, leave, joined in an amazing bond. The 266 individuals who started two years ago are now a powerful and undying unit that forever will be linked as the great class of 2013. For you being a Tuck 13, as I am sure you felt at the beginning was an abstract notion, but now it means something very real in the personalities of your co-voyagers on this journey. Tuck aims at not just conventional success for you, but the kind of success that comes when you share a very special trust with so many marvelous people. The legacy is palpable. It urges you to go out there and succeed by doing what's right, by lifting those around you, by getting the best from others and expecting them to get the best from you. That's what a the Tuck spirit is all about. That's the Tuck brand of leadership. And now each of you will become a member of our nearly 10,000 Tuck alumni who form an extended web of unmatched support for each other and for the school. This beautiful campus and this great faculty and the great staff and caring staff will remain at the hub of the 10,000. 
we are dedicated to perpetuating the Tuck values that have made this community so unified. And all my travels among Tuck alumni for 18 years all around the world, I have felt among them a gravitational force back to this place made up of emotion and care, of logic and commitment, of responsibility for and ownership of this school, pulling people back in person and in their hearts. I believe this unmatched devotion exists because people who have experienced it believe that Tuck is the best example of what leadership education can achieve. And I know that we are all devoted to passing these values down. These core traditions will never fade. When that force draws you back in a reunion, a visit to a class, recruiting, executive education, maybe even someday your own kids would want to visit campus, even your grandkids, come here to check out this campus, and in so many other ways that you circle and land back here, be it next year or in 50 years, you'll find this beautiful setting. There will be another generation just like you of Tuckies being transformed. And you will be proud to be among this band of sisters and brothers. Best wishes and safe travels and remember that we at Tuck crave your involvement. It is our life's blood. So please, no matter where you land on the globe, always maximize your touch points with Tuck and with each other. Congratulations. Now I want to introduce our speaker. Zdeněk Bakala is a Czech-born businessman, investor, and philanthropist who co-founded BXR, Diversified Investment Group, with a global portfolio of assets. He is, an act he is active in diverse businesses ranging from mining to media to energy across several continents and in all forms of philanthropy. So Denyak's contributions have always gravitated toward cultural and intellectual development and human rights. In 2007, he founded the Zdeněk Bakala Foundation, which provides scholarships at prestigious universities abroad to talented Czech students. He also supports the Baklav Habo Library as a center for the documentation and research of modern Czech history with an emphasis on promoting the ideas and works of former Czech President Václav Havel. Zdeněk is a partner in DOX, the Center of Contemporary Art, and he has initiated the opening of CEE affiliate of the Aspen Institute, an educational and policy studies nonprofit organization. Of course, he's also a member of the Tuck Board of Overseers. So then he started his business career in 1989 at Drexel Burnham, Lambert Investment Bank in New York, and then moved to Bank of America. In 1994, Bacala founded Patria Finance, the Czech Republic's very first private investment banking group. In 2004, he was one of the founders of Group Bacala Crossworlds. In the same year, this group acquired OKD, a major Czech hard coal mining company now part of New World Resources. He is also active in the field of media. He owns Czech publishing house Economia. Please welcome Tuck alumnus Zdeněk Bakala. Good afternoon. Thank you, the Tuck School for the honor of being invited uh, to this annual celebration of the quality of the school, its students, its faculty, and its administration. Good afternoon to the class of 2013, family members, partners, and friends. I actually have to make a small confession before I start my speech. 
Uh, in preparation, I resolved to make it slightly different from the speeches I have read in the last few years that, de that were delivered here at this podium at the investiture uh, ceremony. I will not mention Goldman Sachs once. Um, it's difficult, I know. It's extremely challenging to, be, to comment on things economic and financial without saying that name, but uh, I'm very sorry to disappoint you, Goldman fans. Uh, here it is. Let me try it. Let me briefly describe to you the path that led me to this podium today. As Dean Bladen said, as Dean uh, uh, Danis said, I was born in what was then known as, che as Czechoslovakia at the height of the Cold War. Half of Europe was under domination of the co of communist Soviet Union at the time, and the Czechoslovak regime was probably the most loyal and repressive of Moscow satellite states. There was no, ch no choice or freedom in either political or economic life. The government, the government decided what was being produced. The government decided what was to be sold and to whom it was going to be sold and at what price. People worked in mostly unrewarding jobs as cogs in a machine from which they received no incentives, no hope, no ability to build anything beyond for what the, beyond what the government decided they needed to receive. Even educational opportunities were defined and limited by the government. Most people simply trudged along in the system, never knowing anything better. I was, luckily, one of the few ones that uh, had a small window through which I could, caught, I could uh, catch a glimpse of the outside world. Our family once managed to arrange a visit with relatives in Austria and through my experience there over several weeks, I was able to, uh, it became clear to me that outside of the country there was a world of education, life and opportunities and a life of freedom to be, to be pursued outside of the borders of, country, of the country of my birth. To be able to pursue these, uh, I simply had to defect. So when I was 19 years old in 1980, I converted my life savings into, on the black market into 50 United States dollars. I hid the $50 in a single $50 bill in my sandwich, put it in a plastic bag, and embarked on a bus tour to Yugoslavia with uh, several families who were going on vacation, a few couples, and of course the ubiquitous uh, secret police spy. Had I been discovered crossing the border with undeclared cash, of course I would be in jail and it's very likely that uh, I wouldn't be standing here and speaking to you today. As it happened, however, the, bu the bus, once we were in Yugoslavia, stopped for a break at a town called Split. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I hitchhiked to the Austrian border. Um, Yugoslavia at the time happened to be the most liberal member of the Soviet bloc, and the Yugoslav border guards were kind enough to let me walk across the border into Austria. I spent a few months in a refugee camp um, while being processed for admission to, to the United States and ultimately with a plane ticket in my hand and a little bit of money courtesy of the American Fund for Czechoslovak Refugees, which was a charitable organization at the time, I was on my way to the land of opportunity. A few days before Thanksgiving in 1980, imagine how puzzled I was by the bizarre Thanksgiving holiday at the time having come straight from Central Europe. With, uh, with my slightly greasy $50 bill in my, in my wallet, I landed at JFK and embarked on a Greyhound bus trip to California. During the bus trip, I was finally able to utilize the 50 bucks, and you, you would be very surprised how many hot dogs $50 bought in 1980. <laughs> Once in California, with the help of a childhood friend who had defected a couple of years before I did with his whole family, I simply set out to learn English, look for educational opportunities, and generally build a new life for myself. A life that this time would be without an overbearing, abusive government controlling all my, all my actions and trying and making decisions on my behalf. I waited on tables, attended a local community college, transferred and graduated to and graduated from Berkeley, and eventually made my way to this great institution. In the spring of 1989, I was standing or sitting exactly where you are sitting now, listening to the investiture speech and looking forward to a career at a firm called Drexel Burnham Lambert. Um, 
I don't know how many of you remember Jaxel Vernon, but a year later after I joined, I was there, but Jaxel simply was no more, and I was at, back at square one. Many of life's greatest opportunities come when, le when we least expect them and on the heels of setbacks. As Drexel was collapsing around us, historic changes were taking place and historic opportunities were opening up in Europe. In a last gasp effort to save its failed economic model, the Soviet Union under Michael Gorba Mikhail Gorbachev decided to cut loose its European satellites to find their own way. It was called the Sinatra Doctrine, as I did in my, I did in my way, and it promptly led to, a f to the fall of Berlin Wall and to the collapse of the communist regimes across Central and Eastern Europe. Within weeks, I was recruited by Credit Suisse First Boston and found myself spearheading its effort to advise the government, the new governments in Central Europe on their economic transition, on, its privatiz on their privatizations as the head of CSFB's uh, Czechoslovak desk. Those were the days. The Czechs, the Slovaks, and uh, other Central Europeans enjoyed their newfound freedom with abandon. Dissidents and human rights activists who had been in jail weeks before were suddenly running the country. Without warning and with no practical experience, the poets, the playwrights, such as Václav Havel, were free to realize their personal and societal dreams. At that time, there was no playbook for dismantling communism. What an opportunity for the entrepreneurial lawyers, one of whom is sitting over there, Mr. Dan Arbes, uh, bankers and consultants who flocked to Prague and other Central European capitals in the early 90s. We were still in our 20s and 30s. We had the privilege of helping to shape the policies and implement the transactions that rolled back the government's involvement in the economy and helped create the conditions for a thriving market democracy. The collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe marked the beginning of an era when globalization and free markets spread with velocity never seen before in history. Privatization and economic deregulation dominated the global economic ecosystem for the next decades. The role of the government in the economy seemed to have been definitively limited to simply defining and regulating the playing field for us entrepreneurs and for free enterprise. All of you graduating from TAC today have grown up during this era of, of unprecedented market ascendancy, but in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008, the pendulum has swung back. The environment you'll be joining now will be, will be characterized by varying levels of governmental involvement in business beyond what we thought was possible, feasible, or advisable when we were graduating from this fantastic school. In many ways, we had it too easy. Business and financial services in particular were so far ahead of the regulators, and we were enjoying the benefits of a global financial system without any meaningful global regulation. The global financial sector grew incredibly fast, enriching its participants, yet contributing importantly to an increasingly uneven distribution of wealth in society. Globalization and financial deregulation also led, as you know, to excessive risk-taking and leverage, which, as we all know, ultimately resulted in the greatest financial crisis since, and economic recession since the Great Depression. Many countries around the world have reacted to this crisis by dusting off an old friend that had been around for centuries. European royals in the 17th century were quite fond of it, and the friend, was, the friend was state capitalism. The most obvious example of the government either controlling the decision-making the decision of equity holders or actually assuming their role is China, but there are, of course, many other recent examples, such as Russia, the various sovereign funds operated by a number of countries today, uh, the slowdown of privatization in Central and Eastern Europe, and of, and of course also the recent nationalizations in the US and uh, other Western countries in reaction to the 2008 economic crisis. The government is no longer only a regulator and a provider of 
infrastructure that it used to be back then. In addition to that simple role, the government will be your competitor. It will pursue M&A opportunities in competition with private business. And it will never ever shy away from using its, its business influence to advance its domestic or international political agenda. Oftentimes it will do so with a mercantilist zero-sum mentality, which seems oddly old-fashioned among businessmen who are long accustomed to pursuing relative advantage. Back in the Czech Republic in the early 90s, I was eventually able to, to take advantage of the entrepreneurial freedom characteristic of the environment to establish, build up, and ultimately sell my own investment bank in Prague. Subsequently, I and my partners had the opportunity to consolidate ownership of one of the largest industrial companies in the region, which we were fortunate enough after a massive uh, restructuring to take public in the spring of 2008, immediately before the onset of the financial crisis and just as tensions were, ex were accelerating in the global economy. In my opinion, with today's role of government in many European countries, such a transaction would be un unachievable today due precisely to the change in the attitude that governments have towards business and private enterprise. I was able to prosper in an era of unprecedented economic freedom. Things have obviously changed in the past few years, but that doesn't mean that the world isn't rich with opportunities for you too. Success is for those who are prepared to adapt, prepared to stay alert, and to persist. As Malcolm Gladwell says, you need to be at the right place at the right time, as I was, but it's your own analysis that will guide you to that place in time. Tuck has given you the tools to undertake that analysis, uh, and even though governments may, may be more involved in business during your career, as the global economy works through the imbalances created in, in the recent, recent decades, the underlying fundamentals have never been stronger. The world today is freer, safer, and more prosperous than any time in human history. The advance of education, technology, markets is enabling billions of poor people to join the global consumer economy and is creating an abundance of resources and intelligence where there was ignorance and hopelessness at the time I graduated from Tuck. You now have the skills to navigate the policy-dependent environment of the present economic transition, which features a relatively higher involvement of government in the economic arena than in the recent past. You must learn to analyze government policy in the same way you analyze financial statements or cash flow models. And the conclusions of your policy analysis have always have, have to become one of the factors on which you will always base your business and investment decisions. However, from time to time, don't be afraid to disregard what you have been taught in these buildings. Don't be afraid to do something instinctive, impulsive. Throw away the buzzwords from time to time that you wouldn't be able to go through a serious business, business meeting without. Go with your emotions. Don't be afraid to make contrarian decisions. Life will always surprise you. If you keep your eye on the opportunities afforded to you by the long trajectory of global economy and avoid being bogged down in the, in the momentary constraints and hurdles, you too will find yourself the right place for your time. Before long, one of you will be standing at this podium while my children are listening to you. I wish each and every one of you in the class of 20, 2013 good health, success, and above all, the peace of mind that comes from both together. Thank you. So Zinyak, uh, thank you for those inspiring words. Your story is one of inspiration and, and brilliance. And we'd like to offer you a small memento of, our, of your visit here. We very much appreciate 
you're flying in from uh, Central Europe and giving us your advice. And Zdeněk, of course, comes back several times a year and, and interacts with our programs and our board. Thank you very much. And now we come to the conferring of hoods on our MBA candidates. Associate Dean Slaughter will read the names of the candidates. The chair of the Tuck Board of Overseers, Chris Williams, will place the hoods over the candidates. At this time, I would like to call forward each MBA degree recipient to receive his or her master hood. As I call your name, please step forward and the chair of the Board of Overseers, Chris Williams, will drape the hood over your shoulders. Audience, there is no need to hold your applause until the end. Please feel free to applaud early and often. Maximilian Pinto. Brud Fogarty. Stephen Abbott. An An. Nia Anand. Andreas Justinian Apostolatos. Ivan Ardemani. Merit Castinia Arfston. Shavi Aurora. Catherine Elizabeth Augustine. Kelsey Lynn Ayers. Catherine Banty. Colin Joseph Barkley. Rory Barrett. J. Harrison Beckstoffer. Anshuman Bhatia. Andreas Bilbao Ocampo. Daniel Bilbao Ocampo. Paratosh Burla. Caitlin Blodgett. Ksenia Baumer. Christelle Mayan Bouvron. Brian Wesley Boyd. Spencer Marsh Bryan. Marie Gabrielle Bui. Joyce Kadeska. Bradford Callow. Jare Felipe Campos Vienna. JP Cantos. Brian Carlisle with high distinction. Luis Eduardo Blanco. Jia Chen. Leslie McCain Chin. Young Duck Choi. 
Blythe Diana Shorn. Alvin Choi. Taylor Witten Collison. Ryan Confer. Matthew Allen Consigli. Ashley Ann Conti. William James Cornock. Taylor Cornwall with highest distinction. Alvaro Cortez. Jason Corral with high distinction. Charles Adair Culp. Brent Dance. Nishant Daruka. Chris Davis. Daniel Rosenzweig Zada. Mateo De Sabata. Kaya Decker with distinction. Bradley Stephen DeMay. Garrett DeNino with high distinction. William Robert Detlefson. Diego Diaz Paredes. Caitlin Kristen Donovan. Ann Duggan with distinction. Mason Thomas Duke. Morgan Kimball Ebling. Daniel Jorg Esdorn. Dan Ettinger. Christina Ann Fenizi. Kayan Farrell. Lacey Aaron Farrell. Azade Fati. Gonzalo Fernandez Castaneda. Oliver Foley with distinction. Gianmarco Franco. Laura Nancy French. Andrew Friedman. Michael Friedman. Walker L. Fullerton. Katie Elizabeth Gagne. Matthew Gallagher with high distinction. Jonathan Gant with distinction. Alexis Garcia. Tomas Garcia Moreno. John Gardner. Peter Gautier. April Gentile Miserandino. Jamie Garrity. Adrian Germain Thomas. Haley Gilbert. Caitlin Galuli. Yuri Gimberg. 
Marc Genet Caboose. Anirud Goel. Mohit Gugia. Daniel Goligorski. Luis Gomez. Ignacio Gonzalez Gonzalez. Luis Gonzalez. Anirut Goror. Matthew Grady. Leo Gribbleyuk. Chawe Guo. Raul Gupta. Smita Gupta. Christian Ku Hagen. Sabrina K. Hall Little. Christopher Leal Halstead. Wayne R. Harrington Jr. Hannah M. Hessen. Kevin Kang Ho. Lee Kwong Jasmine Ho. Catherine Head. Hillary Hurston. Martina Hessel. Robert Hillis with distinction. Christian Hinoe. Jeffrey Halucci. Michael T. Holbrook. Jason Hooper. Edward Howard. Sarah Constance Hughes. Brennan Joseph Igo. Abigail Wells Isaacson. Daisuke Ishida. Yamini Jagannathan. Anthony G. James. Nicholas G. Jameson. Hugh Jong. Jason Jong. Rodrigo Jimenez. Nia Johnson. Veronica Hubera Maldonado. Talia Marie Judson. Shiv Cock. Daniel Ross Kane. Salome Nokarbi Katwiwa. Siddharth Kaundinya. Christina Alana Kavanaugh. Yoel Kifle. Philip Doyun Kim. Jungwon Kim. Nate San Juan Kim. Kevin M. King. Alex Kranitsky. V. 
Vijay Krishnan. Peter S. Kruger. Ujay Kumar. Ankur Kumar. Mukal Kumar. Michael Kuo. Frank Kwok. John Lambert. Shandon Layak. Ryan Layton. AJ Lee. Francis Lee. Maximilian LaFont. John Lehman. Michael Lennon. Crystal Marie Levely. Sandra Michelle Levine. Lily Lee. Suzanne Rebecca Lieb. Jerry Lynn. Carmen Linares. Graham Cloud Lincoln. Jamie Pauline Lipman. Margaret Wilson McCauley. Jonathan McKinnon with distinction. <laughs> Betsabe Madani. Sankop Malhotra. Bajrang Mandanya. Helen W. Bugua. Thomas W. McAndrews. Aaron Cutner McCafferty with distinction. Kevin McCafferty with high distinction. Benjamin McGinnis. Nishad Mehta. Jason Meyer. Ryan James Miller. Justine Modo Trabusi. Kerr Owens Moan with distinction. Ricardo Montez de Souza. Rachel Lauren Moss. Christopher Murphy. Alex Nadis. Sri Vishnu Narayansami. Hussein Nasruddin. Pablo Navarro Aristizabal. James Powers Nicholson. Jean Jean New. Frederic Paul Nutt. Victoria Haynes O'Kane. Matthew O. Andrew Olalier. 
Karen Elizabeth Olson with distinction. Catherine Marie Perry. Siwan Park. Merritt T. Patridge. Christopher Sean Pearson Smith. Daniel Pena. Eben Pingree with distinction. Mathieu Pluvinage. Nikita Pliskevich. David J. Polbaum. Samuel Pond with distinction. Marianne Porter. Shane Gregory Proch Wilson. Sean Puri. Justin Marshall Purnell. Fred Rab. David Rader. Quentin Lowell Reeve. Scott T. Reinig with distinction. Meg Robinson. Justin Rodriguez. Rafael Romero Hidalgo. Edward R. Ruland. Jonathan Hepworth Ryder with high distinction. Swarup Sampath Kumar. Felix Schmid. Tyson R. Seeley. Emily Servinsky. Devin Rose Shapiro. Shilpa Sharma. Mariko Shimizu. David Sibley. Christopher William Smith. Hemant Sood. Jacqueline Stein. Sarah Ann Stern. Ivan Stern Plaza. N. Troy Stewart. Kelsey Daly Stratton. Utara Sukumar. Julia Sun. Kushala Sunder. Weben Tang. Jihao Kevin Tay. Bijan Teja. Ross Marshall Templeton. Enrique Tilin. Lu Tian. Ann Timmons. Jesse Joseph Toronto. Elizabeth Trankel. Chica True Daniels. James Valdez. 
Maxime Vincent. Bo Wang. Vivi Wang. Charles Matthew Webster. Jonathan Wei. William R. Wentworth, Jr. Shanae L. White. Leonard White with distinction. Jingyan Wu. Liang Xu. Hannah Yankelevich. Elizabeth Yepsen. James Yu. Matthew J. Zepernick. Ying Zhao. Duo Zhao. Shaolan Zhou. Jessica Renee Zofnes with distinction. Joya Ann Zuber. And Sunny Bajaj. Please join me in congratulating the class of 2013. Congratulations once again. And now the chair of the Bo uh, Tuck Board of Overseers will present the Overseers Medal for 2013. Christopher J. Williams is chairman, CEO, and founder of the Williams Capital Group LP and Williams Capital Management. Chris began his career with Lehman Brothers in New York, where he was senior vice president with responsibilities in debt, capital markets, derivatives, and fixed income securities trading. Upon leaving Lehman Brothers in 1992, he formed Williams Financial Markets, a division of Jeffries and Company, which specialized in structuring debt financing for investment grade corporate issues. He founded Williams Capital in 1994 and has since directed the firm's strategic effort in investment banking and its expansion into asset management. Both Fortune Magazine and Crane's New York Business selected Chris Williams as one of the most powerful minority business leaders in America. And Chris has been even ventured into education by publishing two academic, in two academic textbooks that outline the uses of financial derivatives in capital markets, the Handbook of Derivatives and uh, Synthetics, and the Advanced Interest Rate and Currency Swaps. He holds an MBA, of course, from Tuck and a Bachelor's of Architecture from Howard University. Please welcome Chris Williams. Good afternoon and congratulations again to everyone. The Board of Overseers of the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth is pleased to award this 2013 Overseer's Medal to Don M. Wilson III, Tuck 1973. Don is a man of impeccable standards and intelligence, and he has used both in his many years of dedicated and passionate service to Tuck. A forthright advisor who has fostered 
a spirit of continuous improvement and shown unalloyed zeal for Tuck. Don is a model for all Tuck alumni now and in the future. Don has his bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard University, where he also studied the pre-med curriculum and derived great satisfaction from taking organic chemistry. Since graduating from Tuck in 1973, and by the way, I think he actually did enjoy taking organic chemistry, <laughs> Don has had a successful career in corporate and investment banking. As a managing director and general manager at Chemical Bank, Don headed up offices around the world from Tokyo, Southeast Asia, to London, Europe, and the Middle East. He finished his career at J.P. Morgan, serving as managing director in the investment banking division and as chief risk officer for the institution. In addition to being a banker, a husband, a father, Don is also a philanthropist with a strong record of public service. He is director of Goodwill Industries of Greater New York and in Northern New Jersey and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he has established scholarships at both Harvard and Tuck. Tuck has been extremely fortunate to be a focus of Don's public service for more than a decade. He joined the Board of Overseers in 2001, and for 12 years, over the course of four terms, he served in that capacity. For more than six years, he and his wife, Lynn, have opened their home in the fall for various alumni events. He has spent time at Tuck as a visiting executive, imparting wisdom and perspective to students in a financial institutions course and is a former class head agent. But Don's most important work at Tuck has come during his more than nine years as executive chair of Tuck Annual Giving. That nine year term is longer than that of any other chair before him. From the beginning of Don's tenure to the present day, TAG alumni participation has increased from 60% to a record-breaking 71%. And we know that all of you will help continue to increase that percentage. During that time, it also generated roughly $47 million for the school. While Don's effect on Tuck could be expressed in numbers, his impact on the school has been truly immeasurable. In recognition of his distinguished career and his generous service to Tuck, the Tuck School of Business, Board of Overseers, is pleased to honor Don M. Wilson III with the Overseer's Medal for 2013. So you think I'd be better at putting these on? Let's take the hat off and then I'll. <laughs> okay. And there's more. Edward Tuck scholars are those students who have demonstrated outstanding academic accomplishment during their two years at Tuck. Scholars are designated by the faculty at the end of the second year. I will now read the names of the Tuck scholars and ask that they come forward to receive their certificates and be recognized. Please hold your applause until the names of all Tuck scholars have been read. Recipients, after receiving your certificate, please line up in front of the lectern for a photograph. The Edward Tuck Scholars for 2013 are Stephen Abbott, Brian Carlisle, Ryan Confer, Ashley Ann Conti, Taylor Cornwall, Jason Corral, Charles Adair Culp, Kaya Decker, Garrett Danino, Ann Duggan. Daniel Esdorn, Oliver Foley, Michael Friedman, Matthew Gallagher, 
Jonathan Gant, John Gardner, Raul Gupta, Hillary Hurston, Robert Hillis, Brennan Joseph Igo, <laughs> Abigail Wells Isaacson, Kevin M. King, Margaret Wilson McCauley, Jonathan McKinnon, Thomas W. McAndrews, Aaron Cutner McCafferty, Kevin McCafferty, Nishant Mehta, Kerr Owens Moan, Christopher Murphy, Karen Elizabeth Olson, Merritt T. Patridge, Eben Pingree, Samuel Pond, Scott T. Reinig, Jonathan Hepworth Ryder, Felix Schmid, Sarah Ann Stern, Ji Hao Kevin Tay, Leonard White, James Yu, and Jessica Renee Zofnes. At this time, we award prizes honoring those graduates who have distinguished themselves through excellence in the classroom and service to the Tuck community. The Herman Feldman 1929 Memorial Prize. This prize is awarded to a member of the second year class who has done excellent work in his program as a whole and who has displayed interest in the field of leadership. The recipient of the Feldman Prize is Jonathan Gant. The James A. and Sabra M. Hamilton Award in Administration. A desk set is awarded to that member of the second year class who, through personal qualifications and accomplishments in courses in the fields of business policy and organizational behavior, shows the greatest attributes of a capable administrator. The recipient of the Hamilton Award is Elizabeth Yepsen. The Lieutenant Walter A. Jacobs Memorial Award. A substantial collection of books of the recipient's choice is awarded during the first year to a student who has demonstrated intellectual ability and curiosity, sound judgment in academic work and activities outside the classroom, and personal habits and conduct which inspire confidence and enthusiasm. The recipient of the Jacobs Award is Jonathan Hepworth Ryder.
the Charles I. Leibovitz Memorial Award. This is a cash award given to the second year student who has, during the first year at Tuck, made an outstanding contribution to the daily life of the school. The recipient of the Leibovitz Award is Justin Marshall Purnell. the Lillian and Charles Leach Prize for Excellence in Finance. This is a cash prize awarded to a graduating student who has shown excellence in the academic area of finance. The recipient of the Leach Award is Jonathan Hepworth Ryder. the Dero Saunders Award. This cash award is presented to a graduating student who, through both personal qualities and accomplishments in management communication courses, demonstrates outstanding ability to communicate effectively as a manager. The recipient of the Saunders Award is Jessica Renee Zofnes. the Tuck Centennial Student Award. This award is given to a first year and a second year student who exemplify the spirit and the character of the Tuck School. Chosen by their classmates, recipients embody outstanding leadership, selflessness in everyday actions, extensive involvement in the Tuck and Upper Valley communities, and a firm commitment to the traditions and principles of the school. This year, due to a tie, we have two recipients of this award. The second year recipients of the Centennial Award are Peter Gautier and Jacqueline Stein. The Julia Stell Award. A certificate is given to those students who have made a substantial contribution to the Tuck community through their leadership in school programs and functions and for their extraordinary efforts to help fellow students, especially in scholastic efforts. This prestigious award is named for the wife of Edward Tuck and co-founder of the Tuck School, Julia Stell. Please hold your applause until all the recipients' names are called. Recipients should please line up for a photograph. The recipients of the Julia Stell Award are Joe Felipe Campos Vienna, Blythe Diana Shorn, Ashley Ann Conti, William James Cornock, Dan Ettinger, Christina Ann Finizzi, Brud Fogarty, Laura Nancy French, Jonathan Gant, Peter Gautier, Jamie Pauline Lipman, Hussein Nasruddin, 
Victoria Haynes O'Kane. Maximilian Pinto. Justin Marshall Purnell. Justin Rodriguez and Jacqueline Stein. Congratulations to all of our award winners. I'm pleased to introduce the class of 2013 President Maximilian Pinto. While at Tuck, Max has served as president of the student body as the voice of the 21-member Tuck Student Board and the more than 500 Tuck first and second year students. Over the past two years, Max has helped the Tuck community maintain its commitment to team achievement, individual growth, and help ensure the Tuck experience reflects the changing student body. Prior to Tuck, he served as an associate at the Parthenon Group, a strategic advisory group led by Tuck graduate Bill Ackmeyer, who's the former chair of our overseers. Max holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Economics from Williams College, where he captained the varsity wrestling and baseball teams. Please welcome Max Pinto. Thank you, Dean Danos. It's my pleasure to present all of us today here the class of 2013 second year gift. Now, so many of us know that at Tuck, relationships are a huge theme. They've shaped all of us. So to ground us in our second year gift, I thought by telling my story, one story of 260, 266, about how these relationships have changed my life. I came to talk with a challenge, and my challenge was to travel internationally. Now, for so many of you who have come from all over the world, maybe three countries yet to get here, that might seem surprising, but for me, I'd spent the last nine years living within a 200-mile radius that is around Hanover. And when I got to talk, I was poised to find a new way to get outside, but I also approached my challenge with a little bit of reluctance, some trepidation. And as we went through our first year and I watched classmates go around to Brazil, Nicaragua, even on a Japan trek, I stayed still. I just didn't know how to get started. But luckily I didn't need to know because you all knew. And as we entered our second year and classes got overway and people started planning for our giant break, thank you faculty, between Thanksgiving and the new year, I came home and I had a roommate who had all these maps spread out all over our kitchen table. And he was circling countries, he was creating a list that was an itinerary, and I looked at it and she said, yeah, I'm going to 10 countries. I kind of gulped. And he said, how many are you going to? And that was the first gentle prod of, 
many prods and some not so gentle that Hussein helped me think about how I was going to take on my tuck challenge. And it took a lot to book that flight. It felt like I was going one way when I finally booked my flight. But I spent a month away from campus in the first three weeks in Nepal by myself. And that was meaningful to me because the adventure didn't stop when I got off the plane. It got hard. But every place along the way, I had someone behind me checking in on me, making sure that I was ready to take on the next challenge. A lot of times when we talk about adversity, we use the words courage. But courage, real courage, is the result of the process of encouragement. And that's a foundational tuck ideal that is so prevalent throughout this community. It shapes how we have all gotten to know each other over the last couple of years, how we've gotten to know our faculty, how we got to know the great staff. And so our class gift seeks to build on that ideal of encouragement. So in Dean Danos, I'm pleased to report that 97% of our class participated in our class gift. So Mr. Williams, we're building on the 71%. We're going up. And together with an, an anonymous do uh, matching donation through an alumni, uh, we've raised $75,243.64. I have no idea how we got to 63. I was trying to do the, the, I know a lot of people gave 13 cents. I was trying to do it. There's a remainder. It got, a lot of people have given a little, little tiny little cents number too, which is great. Um, and our gifts go into the Tuck Community Fund. So the Tuck Community Fund is a, uh, set, a fund that was set aside to make it so that us students could get to know faculty, each other, and staff outside of the classroom. And it's been part of our tradition here in, with the funds of the Tuck Community Funds to have small group dinners where random groups of students get together and get to know each other much better in Hanover. And so our gift will go to continue to support that great tradition. And it'll also give us a touch point to rally around for years to come as we look back at Hanover. So I, uh, I'm excited to present the gift. And I thank you, faculty, for showing us the way. It's now my pleasure to introduce our class speaker, Brud Fogarty. Brud has an undergraduate degree from the College of Holy Cross, with a double major in English and theater. He then went on to pursue his Master's of Fine Arts in acting from the American Conservatory of Theater in San Francisco. In his career, Brud has spent time as a professional actor, appearing in on television and on stage. He also spent four years into, prior to his arrival at Tuck as a sales manager for a company that supplied packaging to the North American food processing industry. While at Tuck, Brode has served a variety of roles. As the chair of Tuck Follies, he was on the planning committee for the 2014 Arts and Business Conference. He's a member of the Media and Entertainment Club, and he was an active participant in the Married Men of Business Society. <laughs> Upon leaving Tuck, Brode will move to New York with his wife, Jennifer, and his little girl, Malia, and will join Colgate Palmolive in a brand management role. Please help me welcome Brode Fogarty. Thanks, Max. You've been a tireless and determined leader here at Tuck over the past two years, navigating the tracks on behalf of all of us. I think we're all proud to call you our class president. Your moniker on your hockey jersey says it all, buddy. You're the freight train. <laughs> and thank you, Dean Danos, Board of Overseers, our honored speaker, Zdenek Bakala, Dean Hansen, Dean Slaughter, Dean Finkelstein, Dean Lebrano, Dean Paquette, Dean Yeager, is there anyone on this stage who is not a dean? <laughs> Seriously, is everybody a dean up here? I'm, I'm, am I, who am I forgetting? Ah, Dean Johnson. Dean Johnson. Vanderbilt. <laughs> really? I mean, you couldn't just wait out Dean Danos? 
hey man, it was only going to be like another 20 years, maybe another 30 years, tops. But uh, for those of you that are not aware, Dean Johnson will be leaving us to assume the head deanship at the Owen School of Man Management at Vanderbilt. Dean Johnson, on behalf, on behalf of all of us, congratulations, and truly words cannot express how much you will be missed. Thank you. Vanderbilt. I want to say what an incredible thing it is to be standing at this podium today, surrounded by the friends, family, and faculty, faculty who have brought out the best of me and will inspire me throughout the course of the rest of my life. It's really an incredible thing that as a class, we're meeting so many of our respective families here today for the first time, and yet we feel like we already know them just based on what we've shared with each other over the past two years. And I want to take a moment and just recognize the friends and family that are here today. You have raised incredible sons and daughters. As for me, well, mom and dad, the jury's still out, but uh, I think you've done a pretty good job. So my whole family's here today. Uh, my beautiful wife, Jennifer, whom... So most of you actually they probably know me as Jennifer Fogarty's husband, as she has managed to build a larger network than I here at Tuck over the past two years. Uh, and of, our, of course, our beautiful little girl, Malia, whom many of you know as the cute girl in pigtails with the mad dance skills at Tucktail events. Jen, you are not only the superior dancer, but also my heart and my soul. I love you, and I could not have done this without you. So my parents, Walt and Betty Fogarty, are also here today. They're having a busy day uh, meeting my extended family. Mom and dad, tuck, tuck, mom and dad. So my father's actually a T-63, so he knows a thing or two about how special this place is. This class picture, it actually hangs in Tuck Hall. So dad, there were many times in the quiet of the night when the work piled up and the self-doubt crept in when I left my dimly lit dimly lit perch in Stell Hall to find you and ultimately found strength in the black and white version of me staring back from that class of 63 picture frame. I love you, buddy, and I will forever be in awe of you. Yeah, so I spent a considerable amount of time during my first year hurriedly walking past those picture frames in Tuck where our class photo will soon hang on my way to the Buchanan faculty offices. As a matter of fact, one could have usually found me, fall A or B for that matter, to a Buchanan faculty office by merely following the trail of tear stained lecture notes. You know, I'll never forget Professor Shumsky. Where are you, Professor? Talking me down from the ledge when I paid a much warranted and one of those suggested visits after my first few homework assignments in Dex I. So he asked me how I was doing, and uh, I replied, yeah, not well. Um, and then uh, through my ramblings, I managed to explain to him that building financial models was not a prerequisite of my former job playing fat cop number three on the television show Law and Order. <laughs> so help is what I asked for, but what I received was the dedication of a teacher that cared as much about my progress as a student as he did as a person. This compassion and dedication is reflective of every prof professor that I've had the pleasure of learning from while here at Tuck. Thank you to all of you for inspiring me to discover that which I really never knew I was capable of. Oh, yeah, to that end, I would also like to take a brief moment and thank Tuck's unofficial adjunct professor. So once again, Professor Jonathan Ryder, will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and uh, yeah, good luck with that tenure. So uh, while we're in the vein of recognizing people certainly more intelligent, but arguably more talented than I, I would like to take a moment and ask for the Tuck partners to stand for a moment and just remain standing for a moment.
Thank you for the incredibly late nights and early mornings. Thank you for the unwavering support and the infinite patience. Thank you for being as much of an integral part of what makes this place so special as any of us graduating here today. You have been the beacons of safe harbor throughout the storms over the past two years, and you are truly our better halves. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think the canonization ceremony inducting all of you into sainthood will commence shortly after investiture, so stick around. So while the partners may be the backbone, it's everyone here today that is the heartbeat of Tuck. It's faculty like Praveen Kopale, who from his office calls his family to tell them that he'll be running late for dinner in order to work with an inconsolable first year student post midterm who still firmly believes that long tail distribution is a veterinary term. <laughs> it's Sally Yeager who has been so many things to so many of us, friend, advisor, confidant, karate instructor, bail bondsman. <laughs> Kidding aside, Sally, your commitment to all of us wearing the cap and gown here today is that which defines the very best of humanity. We are eternally grateful. I am eternally grateful for everything. It's people like Blythe Chorn, the Igo family, Ozzy Fati, and Tara Sukumar that would call me and ask to babysit my daughter for the sole purpose of wanting to spend time with her. It's classmates like Nishant Mehta, Tori O'Kane, James Yu, Ben McGinnis, Carmen Linares, Brent Dance, Betsy Bamadani, Shandon Layak, and so many others besides who would drop everything in an instant without any pomp and circumstance if it meant helping a classmate. It's the dedication of Matt Grady, Sandy Levine, Brad Callow, Greg Koch, Walker Fullerton, Chris Halstead, Laura French, Christina Fanizzi, Catherine Augustin, Justin Purnell, Baj Manhandia, Shiv Kak, and Taylor Cornwall, who have been relentless in their pursuit of making the Tuck experience as fulfilling and memorable as possible for all of us. It's the sheer, unassuming will of study group mates like Jason Crow, Maxime Vincent, Ankur Kumar, Luis Gomez, Leslie Chin, and Jay Bax Bextoffer, who have led the charge and slung my crippled body over their shoulders <laughs> to carry projects through the flak while always having the welfare of their team members, not themselves, at the forefront of their mind. Guys, I can say without a doubt, I will always share a foxhole with any of you. It's the innovators. It's the bravery and vision of Daniel Bilbao, James Valdez, Peter Kruger, Evan Pingree, Andrew Friedman, Katie Donovan, and Nishant Daruka, who embody the entrepreneurial spirit here at Tuck, having started their own companies while here over the past two years. Grocery Glee, Fish Addicts, Rock Lobby, Glory Days, Raw Foundry, Instant Insight, and Gully Grill. Guys, I will be reserving a spot on the wall of my future man cave for your respective covers on Forbes magazine. Ooh, actually, uh, as Jen and I will be moving down to New York uh, in about a week, uh, I have recently been informed by her that I will be allocated a man shelf. <laughs> Not so much the cave, so TBD on that one. It's knowing that I could call Matt Gallagher at 2 a.m. during fall A to help me build a model. To that extent, it's also knowing that I could call Matt Gallagher at 2 a.m. second year spring term to help me build a model. Matt, I mean this in all honesty. Um, if I ever have a son, I want him to grow up to be just like you. I mean that. Minus the seemingly unending collection of sport coats and horrible, horrible vintage ties. <laughs> I just, let's be honest, folks. It's the pure, unadulterated chutzpah of Pete Gautier, who in staying true to his Texas roots, defied convention, proved the naysayers wrong, and brought the first ever Tuck-sponsored mechanical bull onto campus. Pete, you've been an amazing part of my Tuck experience, man. And I mean this in all honesty. You, my friend, are cooler than a pair of Pino Audius European designer jeans. <laughs> it will forever bring a smile to my face and a shiver down my spine whenever I think of you in drag. 
When considering all of this, simply put, as a family should have, what we got here, folks, is character. And this character informs everything that we have built here over our two years. And really, make no mistake about it, what we've built here is truly very special. It's, it's a shared sense of trust and respect that, to be frank, it's just it's hard to explain to anybody that has not walked these halls. The closest I can come to articulating what our family is all about really boils down to this. It's when Shane Prosh Wilson's passport expires right before his departure to South America over Christmas break, and the sobering realization of this small detail and the subsequent panic that sets in the day before his flight. Now, his only hope to travel was to get his birth certificate from, uh, uh, to Texas from his cluttered desk drawer in Hanover the next day. So what does he do? He posts the cry out to the Hanover wilderness on Facebook, and lo and behold, John McKinnon answers the call. John McKinnon, who I can only assume was still in Hanover designing Bob Howell's winter term FRSA final, so he received the SOS. And now, this is pure conjecture on my part, with filthy, tattered Red Sox hat placed firmly backwards while arm wrestling Liam at Murphy's for a free beer, John decides to do something about it. He proceeds to leave the bar, break into Shane's house, and rummage through all of his stuff and emerge with a birth certificate, which he overnights to Shane in Texas. Now, I can only imagine what was going through John's head as he waited through the tedium that is the line at the Hanover Post Office while ushering this precious cargo to safety. Shane, have fun, brother. Enjoy the Caprianas. I love you. And uh, I left my bar tab open at Murphy's with seven of my classmates at the bar. My God, what have I done? But this is what family's all about. We go out of our way to help each other, and we mercilessly, mercilessly abuse each other's bar tabs. That's just what we do. But seriously, as our loved ones bring out the very best in all of us, that's what we've done for each other. What we've created here is a fellowship that is the lifeblood of this institution. And granted, it's not on front of the glossy brochures, and U.S. News doesn't, doesn't detail it in their MBA profile, but I'm telling you, it hums just under the the surface of daily life here at Tuck. It's a quiet, implicit commitment that each of us have adopted, dedicated to upholding and preserving the Tuck legacy. And in so doing, we've written our own chapter. By any definition, what we've created here is a family. And like family, we've called each other out over the dinner table and sometimes we've driven each other nuts, but We've defended one another to the teeth and always, always circled the wagons in times of crisis. The point is, like a family, at the end of the day, we just don't let each other fall. I'm not big on advice, but my only advice is going to be this. As we prepare to leave our home here at Tuck to begin our careers all over the world, life's about to speed up again. As this whirlwind kicks back up, you may lose deals, you may lose sleep. And for those of you that are going into investment banking, you will likely lose any semblance of what was once a vibrant social life. But I'm just telling you, don't let go of what we built here together. Because through this inevitable loss of days to come, our experience here will enable all of us to create because that's what we've done here every day we've created. Through everyday simple acts, we've created the bond that defines our class. The simple act of escorting a second year classmate to France too because they still have absolutely no idea where that is. The simple act of covering your classmates lunch on Panini Day because they forgot their card at home or the simple act of foregoing lunch altogether to instead cheer on my baby girl as she takes her first steps outside of Burn Hall. It's a simple act of realizing that the rest of your day has virtually no meaning until you hear from your safe but shaken classmates that were down at the Boston Marathon. It's the simple act of retrieving a birth certificate and overnighting it to a friend. If you guys care for the people in your careers and in your communities the way that you've cared, for your classmates sitting next to you on this day, 
you will continue to create incredible bonds that will inspire extraordinary experiences. Take a piece of our legacy and bring it with you to your lives outside of the Upper Valley. So during our admitted students weekend, the mantra was Tucky for life. Admittedly, I had no idea what that meant. I just thought it sounded cool and frankly, a little gangster. <laughs> but after my time with you, my classmates, my friends, my family, I get it now. I, I now understand what that means because my experience with all of you will inform the way I live my life today, tomorrow, and years from now. And when I bring a team together in the future to accomplish something great, and my boss asks me, how'd you do it? I'm gonna look at them straight in the eye and tell them, I went to talk. Thank you, this has been the honor of my life. Thank you so much. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Colin Bladen, who will read the Edward Tuck letter. Please welcome Professor Bladen. The founding patron of the Tuck School wrote this letter nearly 100 years ago to the president of Dartmouth College, passing on some advice in the language of a businessman of a century ago. In the conduct of the school to which you have done my father's memory, the honor of attaching his name, I trust that certain elementary but vital principles on which he greatly dwelt in his advice to young men and in today's day and age young women, whether entering upon a professional or business career, may not be lost sight of in the variety of technical subjects of which the regular curriculum is composed. Briefly, these principles or maxims are absolute devotion to the career which one selects and to the interests of one's superior officers or employers the desire and determination to do more rather than less than one's required duties, perfect accuracy and promptness in all undertakings, and absence from one's vocabulary of the word forget. Never to vary a hair's breadth from the truth, nor from the path of strictest honesty and honor, with perfect confidence in the wisdom of doing right as the surest means of achieving success. To that maximum, honesty is the best polish, so you should be added another. That altruism is the highest and best form of egoism as a principle of conduct to be followed by those who strive for success and happiness in public or business relations, as well as those of private life. Thank you, Colin, and thank you, class, for that wonderful gift. The investiture ceremony will conclude with the recessional of the faculty and graduates. As we conclude the ceremony, I want to invite all of you to a reception here in, in the courtyard. We now send you out to the world. We look forward to seeing you many times during your career. And we want you to do great things. Again, congratulations.
Mm-hmm. 